interesting. Thank you. Oh, hello. Ah. We commission four artists to create a piece of work based on forgotten journeys of four 19th century ships. People who saw her for the very first time would have wondered what on earth is that? How did this ship sail all the way from so far away? In this episode, we revive the Lady Mary Wood, the ship that changed the way Singapore communicated with the world. This is a game changer for Singapore. Singapore had just really flourished. Hi, I'm Ira. Hi, I'm Ren. Hi, I'm Claire. I'm Pan. Uh, we are from Family Art Collective Holy Crap. We became Holy Crab in 2011, when we started exhibiting artworks our children had been creating since they were young. We love art, so we always encourage them. It was an outlet for their creativity. And in a way, it's like an archival of our journey together as a family, in a way that we know best. And we take a no holds barred approach to our projects. Projects that we work on are largely expression and interpretation of what we feel about a particular topic or a particular brief. One of our most important works is the Rubbish Femzine, our very own art magazine that we publish yearly about topics that interest us. From Singaporean food to my parents-in-law's 50th wedding anniversary. One of my favourite is issue 8, which is about 80s music. For one section, we actually composed our own song and made it into a vinyl. And you can find it on Spotify too. <laughs> Seamless promotion, bro. <laughs> <good job. laughs> We take our, our projects very seriously, but at the same time, we are also very serious about having fun. That is a, a, a bit of the DNA about what we do here. To the Honourable Fellowship, <laughs> holycrap.sg. Sirs and Madams, on the 4th of August, 1845, Lady Mary Wood, the first ship from the first ever regular mail service between England and the Far East, arrived in Singapore. Your mission is to uncover the story of the Lady Mary Wood and the significance of her arrival. Thereupon, you will create a new work of art based on your discovery. There can be no use of the internet. Dun, dun, dun. Bon voyage. Yours respectfully, the Commissioner. I, I imagine that the ship would look something like the Titanic, but maybe not as advanced. Pirates of the Caribbean? What era was that? You remember Pirates of the Caribbean? Oh, I don't. We didn't watch Which it. Which era was that? Thank you. Before I let our imagination take over, I set us all down to take stock of what we know and what we don't. What exactly was the Lady Mary Wood, and why was it important to Singapore? What does a regular mail service even mean? Uh, did it stop by other countries before stopping in Singapore? It's clear we know absolutely nothing. If we're going to make an artwork about this ship, we're going to need some serious schooling on everything Lady Mary Wood. Yes, I can tell you a fair bit about the ship. The ship was built in 1842. What's really significant about this ship is that it's a wooden ship but it has a steam engine. So this was one of the first steamships to come into Singapore's waters. So does the Lady Mary would look like the Titanic? No, not so much. But I have a picture. Perhaps you'd like to see it. Donna tells us that the Lady Mary Wood was only 49 metres long, quite tiny compared to the nearly 300 metre long Titanic. What is this? What is this part of it? That's the paddle that's actually propelling the ship. I yeah. see. Apparently, steamships like the Lady Mary Wood sped up the delivery of mail because they were not reliant on seasonal monsoon winds to get to their destinations, unlike sailing ships. In the age of sail, you might wait for a couple of months, maybe even longer, sometimes to send a letter and then to receive one in return might take a, a year or two. But with steamships, you had scheduling. Once there's scheduling, there's much more reliability and regularity to the service. The Lady Mary Wood, Donna says, was part of the first regular postal service between England and Singapore. So instead of months or years, people in Singapore could expect their mail once every six weeks, right here by the banks of the Singapore River. 
So the Lady Mary would really change the speed that mail was received. It really changed the postal service in Singapore within 40 days. And what's more, we learned there was another reason why mail carried by the Lady Mary would arrive faster. What you have is the development of an overland route. Donna explains that traditionally, ships from England had to sail around Africa to get to Asia. But with the overland route, ships could just cut through the Egyptian desert. And this was the route that the Lady Mary Wood served. A relay race of different steamships that would bring mail from England down through Egypt to Sri Lanka, where it would be transferred to the Lady Mary Wood for the final stretch to Penang, Singapore and Hong Kong. So Donna, why was there a regular mail service? And why was getting mail faster so important? All businessmen in Singapore, they wanted to know things about the market. Up until this point, you really didn't have a lot of good information that was flowing around the region. It turns out that ships were like the broadband internet of that era. Besides delivering letters, they also carried the latest newspapers and intel that merchants needed for their businesses. An example would be the information on nutmeg being one of the great commodities that was moving around this part of the world. And so for them, having a regular mail service was really important. So all of this changed the business landscape. Singapore just really flourished by the 1860s and 1870s, partly because of steam. When um, Donna told us and showed us, it was quite amazing to see it was a much smaller ship. It was um, elegant. It gave us a very different image of what this ship was. We are pretty excited about maybe steam engine. The fact that it is a huge leap in terms of technology. I wonder how that affected the people's lives in Singapore in that period. So mail means there's a lot of... Uh, right. Writing. involved, so maybe we try to incorporate some of that writing into the project. What we can do in involves some form of um, storytelling. Yeah. We're thinking of creating a mixed-media art installation on the Lady Mary Wood. This will consist of art pieces using different mediums like photos and illustrations. It's something that we have done many times in the past. We don't really have a fixed medium that we work on, so it depends on the subject matter. Lady Mary Wood delivers mail, so we are thinking of what could be in the letters. The idea we're thinking of could be a story between people communicating across the oceans. Our installation could tell the story of two fictional characters communicating via letters, one in England and one in Singapore. So we start crafting the story. Do you prefer it to be like a... I would prefer it to be actually a tragedy. Like a tragedy, you yeah. think? Tragedy? It can be a love tragedy. Love tragedy. Mummy, what do you think? Yeah, definitely. I mean, something that's um, touching and maybe sad as well. Okay, I mean, okay, that so... Speaks to people. I'm excited that we're doing a love tragedy. But how do we create our fictional characters when we know nothing about Singapore in the 1840s? We have been commissioned to make an artwork on the Lady Mary Wood, the first male steamship to arrive in Singapore in 1845. We have decided to make an art installation telling a tragic love story of two people communicating via letters carried by the Lady Mary Wood. So the person could be living in London and the other person they're communicating with is in Singapore. But what kind of people will our characters be? If we are going to create believable characters for our installation, we will need to know how Singapore was like in the 1840s. Julian, we would like to know more about what life was like in Singapore in the 1840s for the project. Right. Singapore at that time was already a thriving entreport port city. Because of that, there was a much greater intermingling of the races at that point in history. One way that we find out more about Singapore at these times is through these travellers' journals and, and accounts of voyages. There's a very interesting one by Frank Marriott, an officer on a survey ship, going around the Malay and Indonesian archipelago. One of the first things that strikes the stranger in Singapore is the variety of costume. 
Chinamen, Malays and Indians, Armenians and Jews all mingled together in every variety of picturesque costume, giving you an idea of a carnival. So it was a cosmopolitan society. It was all a big adventure for everybody. Did the locals speak English back then? Most probably didn't speak English. There was a comprador. Julian tells us that compradors were locals who could speak English, and they played an important role for trade here. The East India Company traders, they really needed these guys to act as their interlocutor between the local merchants and their own stuff. And then, of course, the steam age, it brought some changes in the Singapore. And one of the biggest changes we learned was that the Lady Mary Wood brought the first travellers to Singapore. Here I have the notice of the very first arrival, and there's a passenger list. And these passengers were, perhaps, here only on a short visit which Julian says was never done before, because in the age of sail, travelling simply took too long. So it wasn't quite like the life sentence, the pioneers of the early 19th century, where you left England thinking, I wonder if I'll ever return. But I've got a listing of the fares. So here, for, for a general gentleman's cabin, £142 for a ticket, and that in today's prices is approximately 29,000 Singapore dollars. The ladies, they obviously needed extra special care and treatment. One of the general ladies' cabins, £152, so that's oh, around about $31,000 or wow. thereabouts. And it turns out the journeys weren't even that comfortable. They'd have to hop from ship to ship just like the meal. So you had to be pretty well heeled to thinking of embarking on one of these voyages and say, oh, I want a holiday, I think I'll go to Singapore. I was actually quite surprised that when the Lady Mary would arrive, they brought travellers from Europe. He painted a very colourful picture of Singapore and how life was back then, even before Lady Mary was coming in. What was exciting for me was uh, the locals could possibly be well-versed with the English language. Which means it would be possible for our character in Singapore to be a local, writing letters to someone in England. Thanks to Juliet, we can now start working on the story of our two characters. I'm drafting out their backstories. We have this character, local gentleman Liang. He's an entomologist and one of the few locals in Singapore who can speak English. He falls in love with Anna, a botanist from London, who arrives here on the Lady Mary Wood's maiden voyage to Singapore. The story deals with how they meet and how they'll be separated, and that's where they have to start communicating through letters. In the story, these letters will include prints and drawings that they make for each other. Like the ones that Ren and Ira are helping me create now. These are prints we imagine Anna will make for Li Yang using plants she studied. It's a word that's called Ai. It means love in Chinese. And Anna would use it in a print as a tribute to Li Yang, who taught her the word. We are actually using something called cyanotype, uh, forms of photography back then. A botanist like Anna in the 1840s would have used cyanotype for her work with plants. All we need to do is to place the shape we've made onto photosensitive paper. Give it some sun, and voila, I. Once that's done, I get to my favourite part of the installation, the drawings. So I'm drawing a praying mantis, which is what Lian would write in his letter because he studies insects. This drawing will be included in the letter Liang would write to Anna. And that's what we need to do next, writing all the letters between our characters. We already have an idea of what they will say. All we need to do now is make the letters authentically 19th century. But what does a 19th century letter even look like? We've been commissioned to create an artwork on the Lady Mary Wood which brought Singapore's first regular mail service in 1845. Since the ship carried mail, letters are an essential part of our installation. I'm helping Ira craft the letters. I'm going to write several love letters by Liang and Anna. To further develop my letters, I'll need to know how people in Singapore spoke and wrote in the 19th century. Come to think of it, 
all of us are clueless about 19th century letter writing. I'm sure there's more to it than what we think. So how important was letter writing in the 19th century? Well, letter writing back then was everything. There were no telephones, there was no internet. So the only way to communicate with somebody far away was by writing letters. So I've got an example here from 1825. And you can see that the handwriting is very beautiful. A lot of care has gone into preparing this letter. If you could only write one message in two months, well, you would take a lot more care yeah. with it. So see if you can have a read of that. Mr. Lake has now approved this, the gift assignment of the something something. Well, this word right here is actually adjustment. It seems that the tone and manner of the language back then is very different from now. Oh, yes. Uh, they were much more formal back then. Even to people that you knew very well, you would never call your friends by their first name. You call them by their surname. And even with family. To give us a better idea of this formality, John uses an example from his research, going through letters of the 19th century naturalist Alfred Wallace. So, for example, the famous naturalist Alfred Russell Wallace, who travelled in Singapore and Southeast Asia, writing to his mother, would address her, my dear mother, and then he would sign off, yours affectionately, and then his full name, Alfred R. Wallace. It's strange. Yeah. If someone became too informal, it would make someone uncomfortable. So even for lovers, uh, were they like very formal to each other as well? They would definitely not be on first name basis. That's usually something that only happened after marriage. I'm just wondering, how come the writing looks like so bizarre and foreign? It looks like that because people don't write like this anymore. But this is called longhand or cursive. In fact, I have a contemporary pen and a similar ink, so I can show you exactly how letters were written at that time. I would love to see that. So this is what they were writing letters with in the early 19th century. It resembles a fountain pen. It does, but this is not a fountain pen. This is just called a pen. <laughs> right? So you dip it in the ink, and it just holds a little bit that'll last you two or three lines. You have to drag it always sort of backwards and allow the ink to come off. There's lots of little techniques and tricks that one had to learn when you learned to write back then. John told us that back in the day, people would put a lot of thought into their letters. Nowadays, people just type like super short messages. Are you talking about yourself? When I message? Yeah, I'm talking about myself. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, how are you? Gay. <laughs> the letters that John was showing us, I think it was very beautiful. We can incorporate that language that they used and the way they wrote for our project to make it more believable and more historically accurate. After the meeting with John and he demonstrated to us the difficulty of using the pen, we actually got the pen set and our ink well. And now we're trying to use it as part of our art installation. But it's still pretty difficult to write because I'm not used to it. So you have to keep dipping and writing. I think that start and stop process so far been quite uh, humbling, I must say. Yeah. But with help, we get the letters written. The first letters they exchange when Anna has to leave Singapore affirm their love for each other. It's here that Li Yang uses the word I and includes his drawing of the praying mantis. I was sketching this right before our eyes met. And I too shall pray that you will be in my embrace again. With each passing month that Anna is back in England, she sends Li Yang cyanotype prints of I on which she writes of her faith in their love and the hopes of being reunited with Li Yang. With each morning, the sun shines and the warmth gives me hope and light, and it allows me to create this love for you. May this warm your heart as it does mine, Li Yang. But unbeknownst to Anna, Li Yang had tragically died in Singapore, and she continues to send letter after letter, only for them to remain unanswered. Now all we need is a finishing touch to bring our installation together. Music is a part of our life as a family and naturally is a part of our work too. I like to create a soundscape for the installation and so I'm working with my old friend Victor, who is a composer and a frequent collaborator. The steam engine is quite an important element for the ship Lady Mary Wood. I believe the engine should dominate some parts of the audio narrative. I'm, I'm not sure what, what, what do you think. 
I can incorporate maybe different elements. Like for example, in a steam engine, you can hear um, like a train, you know. Um, or I can use the analog synth to generate some white noise to come up with a sound that sounds like a steam engine, basically. I think that's great. I've always had this rough melody in my mind. It could go well together. With this soundtrack, our art installation is meant to be an immersive experience that transports the audience back to the 1840s. So as they view the art pieces in this exhibition space, they are also hearing the soundtrack. Through text and photo prints, the audience are introduced to the Lady Mary Wood, to our characters Anna and the Young, how they met and fell in love. And through their letters, the audience learn of our characters' feelings for each other and the pain of their separation. They learn of Liang's untimely death and see the tragedy of Anna's letters as she continues to write to him, still hoping to reunite with her love. This is a story made possible thanks to the Lady Mary Wood and the regular mail service she brought to Singapore. What moved me most about this project was the letter writing, how the characters express themselves through their art and their words. You deal with intimacy, deal with thoughts, people's emotions, connections. I find it quite interesting how the Lady Mary Woods impacted Singapore. I've never learned this in school before. We really hope that the audience will feel the same connection that we have here, combining both fiction and non-fiction, and how we interjected our characters into the historical backdrop of Singapore.